Imagine that a group of high-rank executives is gathering for a yearly meeting. In the middle, two of these executives, both men, cry and hug each other. This is how powerful art can be when we bring it into the world of business. How can art build trust and connection in the workplace? Why it crosses languages and create new bridges? And what is the late night art concept? Today's speaker, Adam Rosendahl, will answer these questions and many more. We are being told to choose between the left and right brain, between studying art and engineering, between creative and analytical thinking. Our society tells us that art and business are not connected. But what if society is wrong? What if it misleading us? The good news is that understanding what art is can bring us to a new revelation. Art does matter in innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship. And with the help of this podcast and its guests, you as well will learn that art is not an object. Art is a mindset. You are listening to the Artian Podcast with me, Nir Hindi. My name is Joanna Miller, and I'm the lead of organizational effectiveness and coaching at Asana. I experienced late night art at an event for talent development and learning and development leaders. And the impact for me was that I was able to clearly identify my core leadership barrier. The creative inquiry tools that the late night art team guides participants through help me. The experience of Joanna, just invite this question. How often do you think about the art of leadership? But did you think about actually bringing art to unlock leadership potential? Hey, my name is Nir, the founder of The Artia, a consultancy and training company that applies an art mindset in the business environment. This podcast explores how art and artists influence organizations. And Adam, today's speaker, is a great example how to create unique experiences in the workplace. Adam is an artist and the founder of The Late Night Art. He fuses art, music, and dialogue to breathe more imagination and connection into teams. Hey, Adam, welcome to the Artian Podcast. Thank you, Nir. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this for a while now. I woke you up quite early, no? What's the time now in Oakland? Yeah, it's just a bit after 8 a.m. <laughs> in Oakland, California. Well, at least for our listeners, I can promise you that Adam looks super sharp and I can share these photos on our social media. <gasps> Doing my best. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, can you introduce yourself briefly? Sure. So my name is Adam Rosendahl, and I'm based here in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. And um, I run an organization that's called Late Night Art, and we, we call ourselves a creative learning and development lab. And what we do is we design workshops for organizations and conferences that's all about building psychological safety. I love this late night art and I have to share my own experience. And maybe I will talk about my experience later because I think it's more important to get to know how you got into this concept of late night art. And I'm interested to kind of ask you, what brought you into this world of art? What attracted you to actually experiment with that? As far as I know, my mom always wanted me to be an artist. Hi, I'm Denise. I'm Adam's mom. Why did I want my son to be an artist? Well, I think it's probably because it's something I had always wanted to be and was not given the kind of support or resources to do that. So when Adam was born, I had the ability to do that. And I lived in an area that was rich in the arts and gave him all kinds of classes and opportunities. And he took to it. It was clearly who he was and he's one of those lucky ones that got to have that identity really strong from the very beginning and there's no end in sight. So she enrolled me in a very interesting art program when I was about four years old called the Berkeley Art Center where all these little children would go and we would throw paint on the walls and they hired psychologists actually to help these all of us young people to like really express ourselves creatively And then they would actually tell our parents about our creative process and what that kind of meant about our personality. So I think that was the beginning of me exploring, you know, and getting wild with creativity. But the big moment for me was when I was 13 years old, I was sent up to a youth arts empowerment camp on Whidbey Island, Washington, that was all about using different art forms like beatboxing and freestyling and painting and dance, but not... as an art camp to teach us to become better artists, 
but we would use these different art forms to connect with each other. And the teenagers who were at this camp were from many different backgrounds, from Native American reservations, many different cultures and religions and um, socioeconomic backgrounds were represented. So I was in a, a very unique environment with uh, young people who I had never connected with before. And through these art forms, I was able to learn about myself and really deeply connect with my peers in a way that kind of, it almost turned these group of strangers into family. And so it felt for me like a magical experience. And from the words of my mom, she said I had a like a spiritual awakening. That was the moment, I think, where I experienced how art can be used as a tool for connection and especially bridging difference between people who are coming from very, very different backgrounds. I don't know your mom, but I already love her. It's very rare to hear a parents that say, I want my kid to be an artist. Most of the <laughs> parents say, I want my kid to be a doctor, a technologist, an entrepreneur, a lawyer. So that's, first of all, I'm already inspired by that. It's funny though, because my, so my mom is like a organizational consultant. She works inside of organizations and does a lot of work around leadership and conflict and communication. But I think she always wanted to be an artist. So she was determined to raise one. <laughs> Beautiful. I love it. So at the age of 13, you realize something very important about art that I think it's kind of spot on. It's a way to connect people from different backgrounds, different cultures, different disciplines, different ages. How did you pursue this in your life that led you to start late night art? I was really inspired, like I said, by the facilitators of this program. So the facilitators of this camp um, had very deep experience in utilizing art forms as, as a bridge for connection and for building trust. And so I started studying in a way, I mean, I became deeply involved with this program. So I went back year after year and I actually took a six month course on facilitation, which was called the heart of facilitation, which was really like my initiation into being a, a guide of group process and exploring group dynamics and the emphasis of this facilitation training program, which is kind of like grad school for a lot of us as facilitators, was around utilizing the arts. And so in this program, which was in Portland and Seattle, I developed my final project, which was kind of the beginning of what would become my organization. At this time, it was just sort of a playful idea. So wait, did you study art? I mean, what age you actually did this facilitation workshop? Sure, yeah, so I did study art. You know, I was, I've always considered myself an artist throughout my whole life. When I went to college at UC Santa Cruz, I tried to study other things like psychology and business, and I felt like an imposter. So anytime I really took a look in the mirror, I said, I'm an artist. And if I try to study anything else in college, it feels inauthentic. So I came back and I got my bachelor's degree in visual art. I studied illustration and painting. You know, I went into the, the job market after that and was hit with the reality that in San Francisco, I couldn't even get an internship after graduating. Because of your background? Well, just because it's, you know, I think the opportunities were scarce. And so even though I, I had a lot of mentors in the art world, it was very challenging for me to find any kind of job in the arts. And so what I did is I moved up to Seattle and I started working as an AmeriCorps volunteer for this nonprofit organization that ran the camp that I grew up um, attending. And I became uh, basically an art teacher inside of a high school in Seattle. When was the moment that you actually took this graduate project that you had that later became late night art and actually tried it with people outside of your course or your program? Yeah, so there was a moment that I was able to, I was invited into a conference to do this workshop that I had created. And the conference was around diversity, equity, and inclusion. It was around exploring race in uh, corporations around the United States and how can we have conversations about race. And at this time, it was, it was about 2013. And so the conference was called D2020. So it was about what's the conversation of diversity in the year 2020, which is funny. I was brought in as a facilitator to lead my workshop and to explore this conversation about race and identity, but using this really creative method that I had created. So this was really my first time ever actually getting invited into an outside context to do my work. And it happened to be this very sort of high profile and heightened 
conversation, which brings up a lot for people around talking about um, differences and their identity with each other. And what happened there was fascinating. Why? Because it was a young white guy um, who's not very involved in the business world. And my audience was extremely diverse range of business professionals who are, all of them were the head of diversity and inclusion inside of their different companies, which are companies from all over the U.S., And um, they had a lot of skepticism for this young white guy who was leading them through something that they didn't sign up for. Um, But the, the impact of it was really deep conversations using these art forms where people were starting to humanize each other and really see their their backgrounds and the neighborhoods that they grew up in building empathy in a way that they would not have expected. And it led to a lot of new friendships, new collaborations, and eventually one of the men in the audience actually hired me to come out to Louisville, Kentucky for my first corporate gig with his uh, healthcare company. I'm interested, why you call it late night art? Why it's late night art if you're doing it with corporate America in the morning? (laughs) Yeah, I know. This has been been a, a bit of a branding challenge for me for the last 10 years. So the, the reality is, The way this organization has been built and developed is very organic, as most organizations. It wasn't planned. I did not have any grand scheme to turn this into a business. This started off as a, just something I love to do, like I said, when I was starting off in facilitation. And I was collaborating with a friend of mine who was really deeply into bringing different meaningful dialogue into group spaces. So he would host these dialogues in the evenings where he would have really different people and he would pose questions and have people really have um, a deep and thoughtful conversation about that. So he combined that, uh, his love of dialogue with my love of art and collaboration and music. And together we kind of built this initial idea, which we were running more as a party. So, you know, we had food and we would bring wine and it was kind of a a community activator, a way of just bringing new ideas and getting people to connect. So from there, there was actually somebody who was at one of our initial workshops who really had the idea that this is a pretty interesting business concept. And she said, what if you added a gourmet food element and you called it late night art? So that was very early on back in 2010, but that name sort of stuck. And so My friend started running workshops under the name Late Night Art in Vancouver, Canada. I started running in uh, Oakland, California, and soon there was this brand and this uh, movement that was starting to develop. And um, both of our projects kind of took different shapes and forms. He ended up moving to Amsterdam and um, trying to start up a chapter of Late Night Art in Amsterdam. It turns out that the culture there, it was a little harder to get strangers to connect with each other through this facilitated process. So it didn't work out as well. Yeah, Late Night Art really took fire in Oakland and the San Francisco Bay Area. And even though we would, initially it started as like a community event at night, um, it transformed into a corporate training and workshop that we were doing in the morning and afternoon and all over the world. The feeling of the kind of sexy feeling of being late at night and having good music and having candles and flowers, we would still have that even in the morning. And so the whole idea of what we do is turning a corporate training on its head. So how can we make learning more creative, interesting, and fun, even if people are learning about leadership development or diversity, equity, inclusion, or if they're exploring how to create a new onboarding process for their employees, it can still have this kind of playful nightlife feeling to it. So that's part of the um, the culture of what we do. What I find interesting is that you started as a community building, but then it became a tool for change. Even though you, we call it the corporate training, it's more than just, let's have fun. It's, there is a purpose over here to create change. And in a second, I, I would be happy to hear some examples, what you perceive from uh, participants that participate in it. But before that, I want to share my experience because I attended one. It was here in Madrid, facilitated by our friend Forrest Stern. And I have to admit that at the beginning, he told me, Nir, come, I want to organize it. We do it at a friend's house. It's probably two, three hours. And I'm like, what? Two, three hours? What are we going to do for two, three hours? And I remember that I came to this Madrileño apartment um, and we were six or seven people. And Forrest was there and 
I enter and the table was covered with a white paper and there were a lot of colors and different types of markers. And, and I was asking myself, what are we going to do? And slowly, with every task that Forrest gave us, and obviously we were six strangers over there, it became an amazing experience. One of the tasks that I remember strongly and vividly is that when I sat in front of someone I met probably 30 minutes before, And first, kind of the guiding question was, what would you wish her if it was your sister? And you look at a stranger and you don't know if she has brother or sister. What does she do for a living? You don't know. But this change to look at her like you're wishing something for your sister, it was very powerful. So instead of asking you to describe it, <laughs> I already kind of described it myself, but I'd be happy to, obviously, if you have something to add over here, because it was really, really unique experience to be able to open up to people I met 20 minutes before. So yeah, that's so fun and powerful for me to hear your experience in Madrid. You know, we've done over 350 events in 12 countries. And I have trained six other facilitators besides myself to lead this process. It has happened in Uganda and Bangalore and London and Madrid. I think in each cultural context, there's a little, there's different nuances, but the main theme is that art crosses language and boundary. It has a way of humanizing people, even if it's translated into different languages. So I guess, how can it be used as a tool for communication beyond language? One exercise that I love to start with That is called the visual conversation, where I get people to sit in front of each other and let go of the normal way that they might say hello and communicate, and they actually have to stop talking entirely. And what I say is, I'm going to play music, and I have you communicate through drawing. And although this seems a little bit silly and maybe random, it opens up a new opportunity for people to connect outside of their analytical mind and let go of their thinking they know where the conversation is going to go. And also opening up to connecting in a way that might feel non-productive or unusual. And people move into like a more creative and playful way of engaging with each other. Um, and it really engages their imagination. That's by the way you did live on stage in the TED talk that you gave, no? Yeah. Between those two ladies in the next sitting next to you on the TED stage. Yeah, I had like the 900 plus people in the audience take out pens and find a partner. And um, yeah, in my TEDx talk, I had folks do this very short exercise, which is just a good example of how we can engage our imagination with another person and how in just a minute or two minutes, some part of ourselves can come out, which we don't normally see. Because when we draw and we show our partner and we create something together, it brings out a whole new side of our personality that people wouldn't expect. And so when I do this with businesses and executives, and we start off with something like this, that just brings out a new side of people. It starts to build more of a sense of connection. And part of the method that I have created is around starting with this connection and opening up our vulnerability with each other so that then we can help each other collaboratively solve problems and find new solutions to what we're working on and really strategically show up for each other in our teams. But if we don't start with this connection piece and this kind of imagination and creative opening, it's just more stunted. So this is the way I like to start. That's great. And I will make sure to add the link to your uh, TED Talk on the show notes. And before we will continue and hear some example, let's take a short break. Would you like to work personally with Nier to develop and grow your artistic mindset? At The Artian, we work with organizations and individuals to achieve greater success. Through our art-based leadership sales and innovation training, we show organizations that there is another way of thinking and another possibility of acting. Visit us at www.theartian.com. That is T-H-E-A-R-T-I-A-N.com to learn more. So we are back and talking about creating connection with art and especially activating our imagination with drawing. So I'm interested to hear, Adam, from your experience working, and you work with like some of the leading companies like Google, LinkedIn, Procter and Gamble, and other. I'm interested, can you share some memorable experience that you had? You probably get into those rooms, especially in the corporate America and everyone, I assume, with suits and you have a group of men and women, and then you ask them to draw. 
I mean, <laughs> what's happening there? When was the moment that you knew the late night art concept is actually touching everyone, no matter your position or your rank or whatever? One moment that really stands out for me, I was in Cape Cod on the East Coast and there was a group of executives that were, they were all the, the top clients of a huge company. And so they were putting on this, this three-day conference as a, a gift and a way of connecting all their clients and also to do research. And um, it was a very, very high-end event. And so these folks were, there was a lot of posturing and a lot of, I think, compartmentalizing where people are really showing the best part of themselves. Everyone's wearing suits, of course. And um, they end up in my session which is about day two in the evening of a three-day conference. And there was a moment at the beginning where I asked people just to start off to have a conversation with their partner and talk about what's one thing that they're celebrating. And when I had uh, one man share in front of the room, he said that I'm celebrating being alive because I've had cancer for the last five years and I really didn't think I was going to make it. And um, I'm just grateful that I get to be here with you all. And so when he said that, in front of everyone. In front of everyone. He was standing up in front of this group of about maybe 80 very high-level peers who are all from different companies. Um, I could feel the whole room soften. I could, feel, I could even feel the CEO of the company who was hosting this whole thing. He softened. And people started sharing one by one from their heart around what's really going on for them in their lives, not just their business successes. And I could feel there was a massive shift in the room. And so... People really started building these deep connections with each other through my process. And it was a profound moment, one for the guy who shared. He told me that just by sharing that, he felt more connected to the whole room. And he built what he felt like were some lifelong friendships that weekend. And it was really because he opened up himself in front of his peers. But it just changed the tone of the entire conference from one of networking and posturing to this is actually an opportunity to build deep relationships and friendships and, and of course, business connections, but in a way that was more centered around the heart. I think that's an example of kind of how the arts and how this process can open people up in a really important way. It's kind of led me immediately to my next question, because there are a few aspects to what you are doing as a tool for change that I see. And you already touched the first one, communication. Another thing that I think you bring with your uh, method is empathy. And I remember that when we had our previous conversation, you mentioned one story about a guy that said, if I remember, will he or will he get married or something like this? I don't remember exactly. It was such a touching story that I'd be happy if you can share it with us. Yeah. You know, I share these moments because I think they're so unique in the lives of these, the teams that I work with. I know that there are certain moments that happen that people, they come back to me five, seven years later and they say, I still remember everything about that, that moment or that, that interaction because, you know, that has not, it's so rare that people really um, sometimes feel such a depth of connection with their colleagues. And so there was a moment I was working with a huge multinational corporation in which each of the people that were there represented a different region of the world. So each of them represented parts of Southeast Asia, different parts of Europe, different parts of uh, North America, South America. And so they had very big roles and their relationship with each other actually had a lot of weight and influence around what could happen in the company. So again, there is a very kind of pre-prescribed way that people are interacting with each other, which is because it's really, there's a lot of, um, yeah, it's very important, this meeting. And so I was brought in uh, as usual, to build the community of this group and to help them um, sort of open up their imagination to what's possible. And so there was a moment where I had people go through a process called where each of them was writing on the table, what is a question that is keeping them up at night? So a personal or professional challenge that feels really, really important to them and relevant in this moment. And so they would write that anonymously, and then each of them would travel around the table and write different responses and answers to everyone else's questions. And it's a way of kind of creating a mind map of responses and giving a lot of new ideas. The idea is really how do we create fresh new ideas to solve each other's problems? And because it's anonymous, people take liberty to really get wild, right? And so I had one, one guy wrote on the table, 
will he get married? That was it. And people wrote, yes, no, um, definitely next year, all different responses. And so when we came back to the table and we had um, people share out loud sort of what their, their learning from this experience was, he shared that his daughter is getting married, but his younger son has Down syndrome. And his younger son's nine years old and he keeps asking, will I get married? And so the whole group, you could feel the whole group start to soften at this moment. And then he, um, you could feel that this man is getting emotional. And he says, someone, for all of you who wrote yes, it just gives me a lot of hope. And I just want to say, God bless you. That's what I remember him saying. And so then some other one, uh, another guy then stood up and he said, you know, I wrote no, but of course I didn't know what you were referring to. And I just want to say that I wish with all my heart that your son does find love in his life and that he does get married. And then, you know, of course, the guy who wrote that, he started crying. These two guys walk across the table and they, they hug each other, which you can tell is not a usual occurrence. In this wow, you're, you're, you're telling me the story again and again, I get goosebumps. It's like... And you, you can just imagine that how the room changed after that. It's like such a human moment. It's such a human moment and it's such... A powerful example of vulnerability and how that brought so much connection and cohesion to this group where they really felt united. You know, they all represent this huge company. And all of a sudden, because they're so connected with each other, their ability to communicate, to have empathy for one another, to, to even like be open about revealing their faults and failures and things that are not going well, I think was... dramatically increased. And so because of that, I think they were able to actually get a lot more done <laughs> over the next couple of days. You know, you started to mention that you asked them to kind of write any challenge, personal or professional. And that led me to my next aspect that I see of late night art. We spoke about communication. We spoke about empathy. And I see over here the role of late night art in team building and spirit. And you always kind of talk about that we always separate our lives. But actually, through your process, we, we bring them together, our personal and uh, professional. Can you share your thoughts on that? I think that in different cultures, uh, within different businesses and different cultures around the world, there's a, a lot of perspective around this, how much do, should we bring our personal selves to our work? The value, what is the value of personal and vulnerable sharing in front of my colleagues? But what I have found in working in over, we've now done late at art in 12 years. countries and that when groups when teams get together and there is some level of vulnerable sharing that happens when it comes from an authentic place it's not a forced place it's always like a someone is opting to share in front of their team whether it's the leader of that team who's for the first time actually sharing that they feel uncertain about the future or it's a new intern who shares that they're you Just like deeply honored to be part of the team, but they do it with this raw emotional way, you can feel that the whole group changes. And especially when everyone laughs, when an entire team who's in a room or a group of executives, when everyone laughs at the same moment, you can feel that their connection is just, you can literally feel the room change. They're dropping in together. There is a cohesion and a connection, like a unification that's happening that is, changes the culture of that whole group. And that lasts beyond that night. My name is Jennifer Conti Davies, and I work in executive coaching and leadership development at Verizon Media. I experienced late night art for the first time at the culture conference in the Silicon Valley, and it was really life-changing. I'm an introvert by nature, and late night art brought the hundreds of participants of this conference together the first night into a really intimate experience. I connected with a number of people that night that I'm still friends with, And it also made the next conference days so much better. What I do is it is a burst experience. It's an hour and a half or two hours. But I know because I've heard so many times from my clients that it's often the, it lives in the life of this team for a long time to come. Because once I've been able to bring a team to a certain place and they feel why I've never felt closer to this group of people than I have in my life, It makes it easier to come back to that place. It kind of has like an imprint in their, in their brain and memory that allows them to travel back there. And so I think that it's really worthwhile, even though it's a short experience. And an experience like that can actually change 
the culture of how people treat each other, how they see each other and how they, they communicate. But if I'm walking into an environment that is not psychologically safe, if people don't feel safe to take risks, if they don't trust their leaders, of course, it's not just like a snap to change that. So that takes a lot more deep work. And usually it starts with the leader or the founder. Beautiful, Adam. You know, you started to, you give a lot of examples that uh, coming from uh, real life, real experiences. And obviously in the last year, we are living, unfortunately, behind screens. And I wonder, how did you manage to do this shift? How you manage in this time that now more than ever, people need this human contact and you're doing it over the Zoom? How, how do you find this challenge? Yeah, I recognize that before the pandemic, there was already a loneliness epidemic and, and a sense of isolation, anxiety, and depression in the United States. And so now with people alone in their living rooms all day, every day, there is uh, an intense need for real connection, for a sense of like nourishment, healing, and anything that we can do to just to make people's situation a bit better. And so I recognized pretty early on that the work that we're doing with late night art was like almost like an essential service uh, to help people deal with some of the hardest time in their life. And so we switched to virtual and I started leading workshops really around how to bring remote teams together and build this connection to their vision, to to each other to and it's mostly about humanizing each other because i think that when we're remote it's much easier to be productive and get our projects done but without the personal connection it's easier to cut that part out because we want to spend as little time on zoom as possible so i'm recognizing that there is a lot of people who don't feel the personal connection anymore so i think that the the tools of zoom are limited, but we've been able to bend them to our will and incorporate. <laughs> I'm still able to use uh, music and DJ uh, environments to create different atmospheres. And I get people to draw, to do creative writing, to do movements. And I've still been able to weave in all of these different art forms into our online workshops and create a real sense of magic, um, even in the online environment. And so I think I've continued to explore and experiment. And we've now created a pretty nice flow where we're working with um, groups as large as 250 people at a time and really able to bring them together in a very special way. But I think using the breakout rooms has been a powerful way of continuing to build a sense of intimacy and connection, like even in a large online environment. Amazing. First of all, I'm very happy to hear it. The, the break yeah. <laughs> breakout room are, are working. It's great. Yeah. I mean, I'm also part of a team that's called the Scaling Intimacy School of Experience Design. And so we teach courses around how to ex design and facilitate experiences um, that translate the in-person experience to online and how to do it in a way that is weaving in these core principles of transformation, connection, and collaborative learning. And so through, through my, my teaching and training with the School of Experience Design with Scaling Intimacy, I've also been sort of on the cutting edge of the best way to utilize online tools to create a really powerful learning environment where people feel connected and, and uh, not bored and disengaged, right? So I do think that it's essential that people study how to make online meetings more creative, engaging, and interactive because it's another epidemic out there in terms of like the burnout that people are feeling. I'm positive now everyone wants to have the crash course on scaling intimacy, but what is one tip that you can give people to build this intimacy, at least one that people can use? Sure. One of the principles is less is more. And I think that online, there is a tendency to try to replicate in-person training curriculum directly to an online format, and it doesn't work. You know, I'd say generally we want to cut at least 25% at least of, of what you would have done in person if you're doing it online. And part of that is we need more time to integrate um, in small groups. And so getting people into breakout rooms and having some more of a debrief process to integrate what they're learning is so important, partly because it keeps people engaged. And if we just try to talk and deliver content, people 
without a doubt, be emailing on the side. <laughs> so I think that, you know, even the best of us uh, get distracted during workshops where it's just a uh, keynote uh, slides and a speaker. So I think that less is more. Take things out in order to make the experience, to integrate it into our lives and to give it space to breathe and to allow for more opportunities for connection. Great. Adam, we are getting into the end of our podcast and I have another question for you. If we have now a business leader, manager that's listening to us and wondering how they, can, they want to bring art into their organization, what is the one thing that you will recommend them to do to make this connection successful? Yeah. So one thing that I, I stand for very strongly is that you don't need to be an artist. You don't need to be a professional artist to use the arts in your work or in your life. And I think that the art, when I say the arts, again, I'm talking about all the different modalities from painting to theater, to creative writing, to dance. There is a deep importance in these different creative art forms and how they can help us connect with ourselves and connect with other people. And there are also tools for learning. And there are a lot more interesting and effective than the tools that we often opt in for, which are just speaking and listening and slides, slide decks. So I think that I always offer up is to start with the imagination. So often we start with logistics or we start <laughs> with, um, you know, we, we jump right into content. And I think that, of course, we want to start with some connection so people feel more like they are really seen and they're part of an experience. But I think starting with the imagination and if we engage people's imagination, it invites more of them into the room. And so one way to do that, that's very, very easy in like the most simple way is just starting with fun music, starting every single meeting, every workshop, every conference, start with music. Because when people walk, when they arrive in a Zoom meeting room and there's good music playing and the host And you know that the host to the person who's curating the space is really feeling themselves and interested in like dancing a little bit. It creates such positive energy that's contagious. And I think that that is something that has really made it honestly a huge shift in a lot of the meetings and the workshops that I've created is just using music and using it with intention. So I think that is a very simple thing that you could do. And if um, folks spend a little bit more time curating their playlists and their music, for their workshops, it will have a huge impact. So that's just one. one. You, you already gave us a lot of tips uh, in this conversation. I highly recommend uh, our listeners to take advantage and try those uh, uh, tools. Adam, founder of The Late Night Art, an artist, a facilitator, a communicator. Thank you very, very much for taking the time and sharing all your thoughts and experiences and stories. I will make sure to add the links to your TED Talk, to the late night art and some of those uh, pictures so everyone can see how sharp you are at 8 o'clock in the morning, Auckland time, on our show notes. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you, Nir, for being uh, the bridge between business and art. I appreciate so much that you're translating the creative process for so many different people around the world. Thank you. It's important to have people like you that are doing similar things and kind of building these bridges. So... Thanks again. Yeah, I feel, I feel like it's one of the most important things that we can do right now is, is uh, being you know, the cultural translators between different worlds of technology and business and art. And I, I love that both of us are doing that in our own way. Thank you very much. Um... Thank you, Nir. Special thanks to Adam's mom, Denise Blank. Denise, thank you very much. I hope more parents will learn from you how to encourage their kids to do more art. Special thanks as well to Jennifer Conti Davis and Joanna Miller for sharing their experiences. I really appreciate you taking the time. As you might know, we are producing our podcast without any help. So if you find this podcast valuable for you, I will be super grateful if you can help us spread the word by leaving a rating or a review. It will take you 30 seconds, but it does help. Special thanks to Daniel Duran, who mixed and mastered this episode, and Abigail Dayson, our intern, who helped us put the message out there. If you are interested in working with me and upskilling your team's capabilities, if you are looking to hone and develop an artistic mindset in a business context, 
I would recommend you to check our workshops and training available on our website. You can subscribe to our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast. All our previous shows are available on our website, www.theartian.com slash podcast. Remember, each episode includes show notes, guest recommendations, videos, and other materials. We are social, so you can search for us on LinkedIn page, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, or just write us an email, podcast at theartian.com. Until the next time, have a great week. I will be here waiting for you with another episode of the Artian podcast with me, Nir Hindi. Once again, thanks for listening.